Hello, how you doing? I'm Craig Parkinson. You are listening to the Two Shot Podcast. Sit yourself down, pop the kettle on. We're going to have a nice old chat. Who's it with this week? I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> Good. Welcome. This is the Two Shot Podcast. Now, I know this bit's dead boring. Please don't fast forward anything. But look, subscribe, please. Subscribe. Leave us five stars. A nice review. Mm. Join us on Twitter. It's at Two Shot Pod. Instagram at Two Shot Pod. Facebook, the Two Shot Podcast. Or if you want to drop us an email, let us know what you think. It's Two Shot Pod at gmail.com. Say something nice. We might even respond. This week... What have I done? I've only popped up north to one of my favourite places ever, into Manchester. I'm in a lovely hotel, having a sit-down with Neil Morrissey. Now, you might know him as the men behaving badly, one off of that with Martin Clunes. You might even know him as Bob the Voice of Bob the Builder, right? Listen to this, have a sit-down. We touch on fantastic subjects, growing up in care, his passion as an actor, and why he's one of the nicest blokes. Let's go. Um, here we are in a lovely hotel room in my, one of my favourite cities, Manchester. Is it, why, why is it one of your favourite cities? Well, do you know, when I was younger, uh, I would, as a treat, I would get the train from Blackpool into Manchester. And whenever I heard the guy on the train go, you're now coming into Manchester Piccadilly. I used to feel a rush of excitement. Really? And I still get it now when I get off, but I used to go to Affleck Palace and try and find a, a nice cheap pair of kickers for 20 quid, which is really <laughs> yeah. hard, you know. Well, I kind of had the opposite thing, because I did two years up here, um, two lots of, two spates of six months when I was doing that programme, um, Waterloo Road. <clears throat> and I hated that show. I hated it so much. So therefore you have that affiliation with Manchester. Exactly, my association with it now is, um, even my missus says to me, you've got to get out of this show because it's making you into a nasty person. <laughs> you, a nasty person? Yeah, I was, getting, I was angry on set every day because the scripts, the delivery of the scripts and the quality of the scripts was so awful and I was tied into it. So it's like being forced into sort of, it's like forced labour and you still, as a, a responsible actor, want to go and give you 100%. Yeah. But it's, at the same time, it was compromised by the fact that it was awful scripts and an awful situation and, uh, you know, it was seven till seven every day and I was promised seven weeks off a year which never arrived and it was like, it was, um, really, really hard work. So six months, literally every day, six day weeks, and other people were going off for three day breaks to Italy and all that, coming back slightly tanned and all this. I was, I was like, felt like I was servitude. It felt like, and I didn't enjoy it at all. I think you need to reconnect with the love of Manchester. To see how I even got started to get tense there, where I started to talk about. I it. did. <laughs> Let's calm down now for everybody listening. Uh, if you didn't already know, I'm sat here with uh, the fantastic Neil Morrissey. Neil, how are you? I reckon I'll make it, mate. Yeah. This is good news. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining me today. I'm really. It's a pleasure, mate. Um, there's loads of things I want to talk to you about because you've been doing this for, for a long, long time. Yeah. But I want to go right back. Uh, where, did you grow up in Stoke? Yeah, I was born in Stafford. Right. So the first 10 years of my life, I was in Stafford, um, a little town in the centre of Staffordshire. And uh, then I went to Stoke when I was 10, when I was taken into care. But yeah, there was 10 years in, in Stafford, you know, me and three brothers marauding and uh, burgling and uh, causing trouble and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you say that with, with a smile on your face, but it, it, there were actually quite dark times. Yeah, um, um, you've got to remember it was, uh, I was born in 62, so um, any time between 62 and 72 when I was taken into care was, um, we were Irish family, Irish parents, you know, and the Irish... And where was your Irish heritage from? Uh, my mum's from the north, Armagh, yeah. uh, um, South Armagh, and my dad's from the south, Kilkenny. But it didn't matter. If you were in England and you had an Irish accent, accent in the 70s, then you were bombing the English, you know. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, and um, so there was a lot of um, um, racism against the Irish. At that, at that time, which is still sort of hung over from the 50s and the 60s when the massive, um, well, even before that, when there was a massive influx of Irish people coming over here, you know, because of various troubles, etc. 
So we, we had that, so we were tired by that brush a little bit as the family. Not that we understood that as young children, but that certainly uh, retrospectively must have had a, a, a sway on the social services when it came time for them to decide that it was unsafe for us to live at home any longer. Why, w- do you mind me talking about that? No, How, go on ahead, yeah. Why, why did they deem it unsafe for you to stay at home? Was it, all, was it you and your two brothers? Me and three, there was three brothers. Three brothers. Yeah, we were very naughty children, that's for sure, but we were feral. I mean, whilst my parents were, were, were nice people, they were terrible parents. <laughs> they were proper go-down-the-pub-and-leave-them-indoors uh, parents when we were very young, you know. What, if like I was to, about five or six, that young girl. Yeah, yeah. even, uh, who knows, could even be before. I remember being about six and sitting at the top of the stairs and screaming my head off until a neighbour came round because my parents were out, you know. Uh, and but how much does that disturb you? I don't know. How much does it, um, how much of a scar does it leave? I don't know, really, you know. I've always been a fairly sort of um, calm person in general. But, yeah, those kind of, that's, that's, that's kind of what was going on. I'm not sure whether the the council moved us because they didn't pay the rent as well, so we ended up in a kind of a horrible, horrible house where they had to go and burn the, the coal fires. There was no central heating, no bath. Yeah. Um, they had to go and burn the coal fires to dry the walls out before we moved into it because the rent wasn't getting paid on the previous house or something like that. I don't know. It's a scant memory. There was no indoor toilet and there was no um, bath. And this is, we're talking about 1970s here, you know, it's, it's not the dark ages. Yeah. And you used to wake up and the plaster had fallen off the roof onto your bed, you know, and things like that. It was a uh, squalor. But then the social services who placed us there said that the house was unfit for us to live in and therefore unsafe. And so they took the children away. But they were the ones who put us there in the first place. And how, what's the age differences between you and your brothers? About two years between all of us. So there would have been Danny um, is the youngest. He was... Um, when I went into care, he would have been about eight, going on nine. Then there was me, who was ten. Steve, who was about eleven, going on twelve. And then there was John, twelve, going on thirteen. Um, who was the eldest? <clears throat> Steve's no longer with us. The um, um, the one, my elder brother. There was two dark haired and two fair haired. Um, the the fair haired ones were the, the youngest and the eldest. And then in the middle, me and Steve, we were dark haired, dark eyed. But Steve had a massive accident in his twenties, <clears throat> and. Um, Ended up having all kinds of brain damage and was then a real problem person. You know, never really got over this kind of mental issues that he had. Ended up doing a couple of stretches in prison and um, was found dead in a flat in Wolverhampton three weeks after he died. Probably, we think, um, um, experimenting with heroin. Right. And were you, did you lose contact or were you still close at that time? <clears throat> During this period when he was absolutely mental, <laughs> we all, the family, sort of lost contact with him. And I don't want to sound awful, but he was such trouble. He'd go and burgle your house or, you know, hit your children and, or attack you. And he'd always be attacking other people. And it wasn't his fault. He really was in a, in a weird state. And he, he wouldn't take his own medication. He was constantly in contact with out-of-body uh, people, God. And, uh, you know, he's sure he could um, contact, talk to God. And he was always having conversations. He was one of those people walking down the street having conversations with voices etc so he was in a proper state and he wouldn't take his medication and he, did, um, did you as a as a unit as a family try and reach out to help him because obviously yeah everyone did my parents were both psychiatric nurses really? so yeah so there was plenty of uh, but there was no you had to if if you even in, in in that state yourself particularly at, at that period you had to go and seek help yourself. They couldn't, it couldn't be forced upon you. Even when he was in prison, because he went and served a couple of stretches in prison, they, um, no one really... It was just the mental bloke in cell 14 or whatever it was, yeah. whatever he was. And so when he was out, it was just dangerous to be around, and he was um, constantly causing trouble. I mean, in terms of, really, we break into my mum and dad's house and foul the whole place up, and I mean that in the absolute toiletry sense. Right. Um, so there was a kind of a fear of him as well, because he was very strong and, um, you know... So in a sense, when someone is... It was such a burden on the family, and it was, it was awful. It was one of those uh, situations that when he did die... It was like a sense of relief, and not just for us, but for him, because he was able to rest. His mind was, must have been so active with the voices and the demons and the devils and the, the behaviour, which somewhere inside his head he must have known was inappropriate, wrong, and self-torturing, etc. that it was probably it was a relief for him and it was a relief for everybody when we were able to bury him, you know. 
just going back to when you were taken into care, um, were you? did you remain as brothers into care or were you split off into... No, we were taken into court and um, we'd been in court before, so it wasn't unusual. It wasn't thing. the first time. No, no, it wasn't the first time we'd been in court. We'd been in court a number of times before for what? I can't remember. I mean, there was only 10 at this particular point. Um, so you're just thinking, oh, it's another morning off school, this will be fine. You know, we, we, my mum licks her hand and wipes your side part in. You get into court, there's a man's going to shout at you, and then you go back to school and everything's fine. But not this day. Um, we were taken out of the court. My parents were sent out of one door. We were sent out of another, me and my brother Steve. On his birthday, the 9th of May, so he must have been, it must have been in his 11th birthday. Wow. And I must have been 10 going on 11. And um, he, then we were taken to social services offices and then he was taken out of one door and I was taken out of another and we didn't see each other for about a decade. Really? Yeah, and we were really close. We were like the terrible twins, you know. We looked similar. People couldn't distinguish between us, which is odd, actually, when I look back at photographs, but anyway. Um, but, yeah, we were, we were very, very close. And I wasn't even allowed to see my parents for six weeks because they wanted us to be institutionalised before seeing any family again. This was, this was like how it was in the 70s. So where did they, where did they take you? I went to um, um, a place in Stafford called Rotherwood. I don't even know if it still exists, which is an assessment centre where you go for a number of weeks and they figure out what would be the best home to send you to. So um, I was there for about six or seven weeks. I absconded a couple of times, you know, because it was easy. And, um, you know, got in a few fights. It was a very quick learning curve. I've never been, you know, apart from my parents ever, and suddenly I'm in an institution, you know, uh, with kids who are 16 as well <clears throat> and tattooed and stuff like that. And, um, and other kids who are a lot younger than me as well. And you, know, re- you get sort of into relationships in terms of, you know, buddies, cliques, things like that. You know, you learn how quickly how to, who to be aware of, you know, who's going to smack your head yeah. in, in the toilets. You know, and there were sort of sexual predators and things like that there, but in a kind of a, a childish sort of discovery way, you know, have you got hair yet? You right. know, um, can you, do you masturbate, you know, or whatever. Um, so it's a, it's a sharp learning curve because there isn't, that there can't be the same parental guidance or sibling guidance that you'd normally get at home. Did you feel because of that experience it forced you to grow up much quicker... Very much so. ...than a normal 10-year-old? Yeah, you had to be very aware of everyone around you. You didn't have the freedom of play. Or um, when someone had done something to you or was um, threatening you or whatever, there was no parent to go to because you didn't trust the staff. I mean, pretty much day one, a woman threw a clog at me, you know, because I'd, I'd overstepped my bedtime mark, but I didn't know what time I was meant to go to bed. I mean, I arrived there that afternoon... And I got shouted at and cuffed around the head by a member of staff. So you think, rather like teachers, right, I don't trust them. Yeah. And you can tell, I could tell, they were constantly trying to do the assessment thing. So what do you think of this? What do you think of that? Questions that you never really had at home. Not, you know, here's a bag of crisps and a can of Coke, go and watch telly. It was all a bit tough. So you sort of wondered why. And then there were consequences to certain situations if you... Um, said, oh, yeah, I really miss my mum and dad, I really miss my brothers or whatever, then there'd be a social worker visit that came on the back of that, you know, oh, I really want to go out and kick a pigeon. Oh, you want to kill things, do you? Know? <laughs> I mean, I'm 10, is yeah. what I, would, I wish I was able to say. Because they do, they did do an IQ test on us. You know, when you get in there, you do this test where they put you in a room with a book and they tell you to, uh, they put a timer on and say, right, open the book at page one, and then you answer the questions. And that's like a, a Mensa-type test, you know. It gets slightly more difficult as you get through. And anyway, I finished this thing in about 20 minutes, and they came back into the room after about half an hour, and I was just sitting there twiddling my thumbs, and they went, what are you doing? And I said, well, I've done it. And they said, well, you can't have. I said, I have. And I said, how long, what, what, you know, and they looked at it, and it was all correct, They didn't believe it. They got another book out and then sat there and watched me do it in 15 or 20 minutes. But it turns out I had an IQ of about 156, you know, something like that, which is pretty good, apparently. Yeah. And um, so from then on, they everything that I did, when they said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I remember saying raffles or something like that. I want to be a cat burglar. (laughs) (laughs) That stayed on my record, and I've got all my records until the day 
I left the care home system at 18 years no. old, that I wanted to be a prof- that my ambition was to be a professional burglar. <laughs> Can you imagine? From the, from the imagination of a 10-year-old, the excitement of climbing over the roofs and sneaking in through windows and taking a lady's diamond with a bit of lace. Well, you know, of course, at the moment, my son wants to be a spy. Correct. Yeah. You know, we want this exciting sort of imagination thing. So because, I, because of the IQ matched with what my, I'd said my ambitions were, then they, they had me down as possible dangerous, you know. So you were obviously naturally very bright as a kid. Yeah. How did all this impact school life and education? Well, I was then, um, after was out of the uh, care home system, the, the, um, um, the assessment centre, I went to a place in, in Burton-on-Trent and I wasn't getting on with the other kids. Some kid was threatening me and I hit him with a chair <laughs> <laughs> and bit, him, bit his face quite severely. And they thought it's best to put me somewhere else, somewhere from away from this family. Because yeah. it was a kid I had a fight with in the, care, in the first care and I had a fight with him because uh, he tried to... Fag me, really, you know, if you call it in the public school sense, tried to make me his slave. And so I hit him. And then his big brother, um, who was like 14 when I was 10 or 11, big difference in those days, uh, was threatening to, to, to hurt me, to hurt me. He's going to hurt me, leave me notes in my pigeonhole and everything. So I just picked a chair up and whacked him on the head with it. And then I, I was in a frenzy, you yeah. know, and it took a few staff members to take me up, to drag me off him. But they decided it was best then to put me somewhere else. And that's when I ended up in Stoke on Trent. With um, aunt, I ended up with Auntie Margaret. I wasn't the first case, but th- I hadn't been to a normal school for over a year. And then I went into the school, and they did a test on me, and I just was in the top stream. So it was it, that was handy. There was three streams, like I think maybe four: A, B, C, and D. And I was in the A stream. So, and I got on great there. You know, there was people of you know who were on the same level, smarter, and on the same level. And uh, that was that was okay. I was um, able to pick that up quite quickly and get into the school routine. I hated doing homework, but I passed all my exams, you yeah. know, every week and every month or whatever they did. But I was a bit naughty. <laughs> but did you see? Did you feel happier at that school? Because I'd you, always loved you... school. I loved having my mind occupied, and I loved learning. You know, um, I was a bit cheeky, so some teachers hated me, and that's the the, the classes that I learned less in. Um, when the teacher wasn't so good, really, yeah. you know, if I could, um, um, if I could challenge a teacher on a particular point and they didn't have an answer, then to me they were they would be seen as a little bit lower, you know. And um, the ones who who could really look after you, you know, in a in a sense of keeping you occupied, etc. And one of those women was a woman called Sheila Steele, um, who um, was an amazing English teacher. We had such a weak English teacher called Mr. Keys. We used to throw the board rubber at him, you know. It was... Um, anyway, what end of term happened, Mr. Keys was no longer, and in his place was Sheila Steele. And Sheila Steele... Good name. Fantastic name, yeah. isn't it? Because she was a bit scary. Um, she, uh, within about three minutes of the opening of the class, because I don't know if she'd had a report about who was going to be trouble... Um, she took me out of the class, slammed me against the wall, pushed a script in my chest and said, you're in the school play. Really? Learn Colonel Jeffries. And is, is that where the, sort of, the acting book sort of started to happen 100%. for you? So it was enforced on you? Was it not, was, did you not think about it prior to that? Not in the slightest. I hadn't any aspirations to be anywhere near a stage or having anything to do with it. And um, she said, you know, learn... Anyway, as it turns out, we have the rehearsals, they're after school, I'm suddenly being occupied, I'm, I'm nervous, obviously. But How I'm, old are you at this point? I must have been 12, right. 11 and a bit, 12. And um, so I've got to learn this part and be in the school play, where I'm now meeting different people from different years as well, in different classes. Oh, because of course they're all bunched together for the school Everyone's play. bunched together yeah. from different classes and different um, and people who wanted to be in it as well. You know, and I didn't know I wanted to be. But I'm getting praise all of a sudden. And, and then when you're actually doing the play, you're getting applause. The care home, pardon me, loved it because um, I'm doing something. I'm doing something after school. I've got a new interest, etc. I started being less naughty. And it's so it worked on so many levels, and I and I absolutely loved it. I loved getting laughs yeah. on stage because I was a cheeky little chappy anyway, and I loved getting um, applause at the end of it. So, in a sense, I'm getting the loving and the patting and the the sort of you know the parental things that you you miss or you didn't know you missed until you don't um, until you start getting it again. I was getting all of that all of a sudden through this acting stuff. 
So you really found a focus because of this play. And if you, send, if you think about it, a family, because then we started to get into youth drama, local youth drama, and they'd welcome you with open arms. It was this thing, yes, come in, have a go. Oh, my God, aren't you good? Oh, that's good. Yes, praise, love, stroking, yeah. etc. Stuff that I was obviously missing but didn't know. And there, there was my family, was this acting fraternity. So after the play, obviously, the thing is, with a school play, there's, what, maybe one a year, yeah. isn't there, really? So after that school play finished, did you find that you had a void and you were needing to find something like after school extracurricular correct so what did you do there was there a local yeah. drama st- where was that in there Stoke was, there was a local um, one, there was a thing called Stoke Schools Theatre that started up and um, it was it was run by um, like these two guys Ken Lowe and, and Brian Hadley and Brian is still a, a, a lifelong friend Ken sadly is not with us anymore and he was a, a fantastic man um, but they did this thing called Stoke Schools Theatre which now draws on all the schools in Stoke to put on a big production at something like the Mitchell Memorial Theatre right or, that still happens now um, I don't think that's in existence anymore but there are other youth um the stoke rep where i ended up going down with brian hadley who was one of the directors there he was also head of drama at enzo high school and he's only retired in the last sort of five six years i think and and he was he was a brilliant director especially for kids because he's the head of drama he was tough i learned all my theatrical discipline from that man because he's Scared as shit. Did he? Yeah, he was. Was brilliant. he a stickler for time? Yep. Yeah. Turning up on time, yeah. and how dare you not? That you've had three weeks to learn that line. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so all the things that sort of scare you. Uh, but he was basically pre- prepping us, and a lot of actors have come out of um, uh, from under his wing and become professionals. You know, because you really did learn to quite a high standard from these people. But that um, was where we went. We went and sought that. So through the Stoke Schools Theatre, we then started working down at the Stoke Rep as well, which is an amateur company. But it was a self-funded um, organisation with all these grown-ups who yeah. were like solicitors and teachers and uh, you know working in the milk factory or whatever. You know, a carpenter and a you know a metal worker bloke. You know, ch- people in the pop banks. Um, so there's all this new mixture of people who are adults and, and youths, you know. We were the youngest, at probably 13, 14, when we started doing that. But it was really helpful because we were building all the sets, you know, we were facilitating, the, we were doing the props, helping with the lighting. Because it's very rare that we were actually on stage at that point. If they, I remember in Vivat, Vivat, Regina, we were the set changes, but we had to wear tights and, uh, and tunics. <laughs> and how much fun did we have taking the mickey out of each other, wearing tights and tunics, tabards, <laughs> and changing the sets, etc. And playing the odd servant, you know. And, uh, but that's, that's where we got our breaks, and that's where we understood the stage craft as well. So this family is now teaching me a profession, you know. And it How was fantastic that you, that you were learning all of those things at such a young age. Yeah. And did that carry on for a few years? Yeah, that carried on right the way through, right up until I went to drama school. You know, we'd be going down at the Stoke Rep, and um, even the sixth form college then, Ken Lowe, who was one of the originators of Stoke Schools Theatre, was the deputy principal at the sixth form college. Uh, and he uh, used to put on these quite lavish plays, you know, that we uh, at the uh, sixth form college, because now we're all 17, 16, 17, 18. And everyone's got a much better understanding. So now we can dabble with Shakespeare a bit. You know, we could do uh, more grown up plays, etc. And um, and have the sets and the lighting because there were other students there who were interested in that part of the, the game too. And uh, the production has just got bigger and bigger. So all the way through till when I applied at drama school. You know? And who, what, do you remember who it was that first went, do you know what, Neil, maybe you should think about this for a career or is it something that you thought, this is what I want to do? That's ex- it's exactly what I thought, this is what I want to do. And bear in mind, I'm still in the care home system and they, no one wanted me to become an actor. My... Uh, um, form teacher at Sixth Form College told my um, foster parents, because I had to get myself fostered at, at this point, otherwise they'd have sent me to a working boys' hostel, said, do not let Neil become an actor. He doesn't have the aptitude to become an actor. Wow. Still not, not sure what aptitude means. But, you know, <laughs> but they said he doesn't, won't have the aptitude to become an actor, and that just made me rebel more. So I've, I've, even, I've got all the paperwork. I applied to the uh, council for assistance financially to go to, number one, to apply for drama schools. It was about £12, you know, and I'm talking about 1980, you know, £12, a lot of money. Well, much cheaper than it is now. Exactly. <laughs> and um, and um, 
and also for the train fare to get to London to go and do these auditions. So they refused. They didn't give me any money. I've got the applications being turned down. I've got them all signed off. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, <clears throat> I did a documentary about a care home kid called Care Home Kid with the BBC, and we started off with all the documentation of throughout everything from from the day I was taken out into court and out from all the social services, all the. Um, uh, uh, probation officers reports all the school reports um, judges reports everything I've got the lot and then throughout my um, life in um, the care home system with various assessments by various um, people one day there'll be a book but I haven't got time at the moment <laughs> and, um, and 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 you know my application for this amount of money they wouldn't let me do it. So I got myself a Saturday job, which I probably should have done anyway. You know, I was trying to take the, uh, the quick route out. Yeah. The smart route, really. Yeah. You get someone else to pay for it. And then I... Uh, so I got a job at Just Pants Plus, and, uh, which is a jeans outlet in Handley, and earned myself the money. And got down to London and auditioned at two drama schools and uh, Central and Guildhall and got in at the Guildhall. And who was in your support network then? If you've got people going, actually, no, Neil shouldn't be an actor. Who at that? What age were you now? Nineteen? No, I know. I, I was. I arrived at drama school at eighteen, so I'm Did seven. You? I'm seventeen now. So who was in your support network? Well, um, there was like Brian Hadley would have been supportive. He would have gone through my um, uh, audition speeches with me, Ken yeah. Lowe. <clears throat> I've got a feeling they may have even bunged me a fiver as, as well, you know, and said, Ian, you know, you're going to need to eat. Because yeah, I, I didn't think about sandwich. Things, I didn't think about things like that. And, um, yeah, no, I was just out there by myself um, going out there and doing it, you know, because even my parents really didn't really know what I was up to. Can you remember how you were feeling when you first stepped into drama school to audition for the first time? I was nervous but confident. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure I was fairly confident. Um, I had no idea, because you're up against the country, you know, you're, now you're up against the whole of the UK and um, the world, really. Yeah. There's a load of people coming from America, and uh, there was Israelis, you know, and um, Swedish people, and, you know, there was a whole mixture of various people. And it's like um, uh, any of those auditions that you're sitting around in a room with, a, I don't know... A, a hundred people passing through, uh, going in to do a two-minute speech before getting a recall or whatever, you know, because it was a recall weekend. And people are bringing out guitars and singing, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, these people are amazing. <laughs> you know, what, what's the little lad from Stoke going to... How am I going to be able to impress? And um, so I went in and did my speeches, and there and then they... they pretty, no, actually, you go home. Yeah, you have to go home after that. And then you get a letter saying, you have got your recalled for the weekend, <clears throat> which <clears throat> is a massive confidence booster because then you've got 60 people for 20 places. So now you've got a three-to-one chance. Yeah. And the, you do the whole weekend, and it was a, a wild weekend. Uh, you know, I was... Again, I was slightly <clears throat> naughty, slightly irre irreverent about the whole thing, a, a bit quite obviously confident... Because now they're taking apart your performance. They're, they're taking apart your speeches and, um, and making you do weird things. You know, like I was doing Edmund, uh, um, the bastard speech in Edmund. But they said to me, you're in a swimming pool and Ed Edgar is in the, in, the swimming, in the lane next to you and he's beating you. Now do the speech. <laughs> <laughs> And it's basically, can you cope with direction? That's what they're looking for, is can yeah. you follow direction? Can you learn? Are you, are you um, um, a sponge, you know? Um, or are you just going to be... Are you already the finished article? So, of course, you know, I was desperate to learn and did all of that. And um, they, they liked it, and we, we got in. You know, the 20 of us who were there, we got in. And so you got in, and then you get the letter in Stoke saying, right, you've got in. Yeah. Well, we and waited till the end of the day. I mean, you could hang on. The audition's finished at about 6 uh, and then at about half past nine, ten, if you wanted to, there was only a few of us who hung on. I just wanted to know. And um, so we hung on, hung on, hung on. And then they came in and said, OK, you lot go to that room. You lot come to this room. Really? Yeah. Congratulations, you're the ones who are in. And then they have to go into the other room and say, we're terribly, terribly sorry, but this year you haven't made it. And was there a part of you at all that thought, I'm in the other room? Well, everyone who was in the room we were in thought we were out. Really? Yeah, because, you know, you just expect the worst. Everyone thought we weren't going to be in it. Because everyone was like, what? what? Did you say that again? Yes, we've, we've got a place for all of you, you know. Wow. So, of course, what year are we in now? So you get accepted to drama school. Uh, must be 1980. It must be 1980. 
Yeah, that's right. It must be 1980 when I get in. That's right, yeah. Because so I was 79, I was doing a thing with another Stoke company up in Edinburgh. Yeah. So you've got now fees to think about. And yeah. Cause it's, where uh, did you go on that route? Okay, the fees are... Um, it's not like these days. It wasn't a degree course, um, and you had to apply to your local council. To get the grant. To get the grant. and um, Something that is sadly a thing of the past. Yeah, I know, but they didn't give me a grant. They didn't? No, and there was one of the applicant who was um, um, a, a boy from a normal home, you know, who'd uh, got a place at a drama school. Um, I don't know who he is. I mean, he must be the same age as me or maybe a year older. Don't know who he is. Um, but he got the grant. And so I turn up at drama school with my name They're there and they read out the register and then say, Neil, we'd like a word with you afterwards. <laughs> and I go in for a word with them afterwards. And uh, he says... Uh, so we haven't got any money for you. And I went, that's correct, yeah. <laughs> he said to us, so what are we going to do? I said, we're going to write to my MP and we're going to write to various benefactors and we're going to write to people who we think might um, want to sponsor me. And he went, OK, great. So we did, we wrote to my MP and we wrote to all of this and eventually, about five weeks in, so they carried on teaching me, you know, carried on with me on that's the course. That's brilliant. But how fantastic that you went in there and went, look, I haven't got this, but this is a plan. We've got a plan. Yeah, yeah. So you're still going in there being really positive. And, and the odd thing is, had I been with um, proper parents, they probably wouldn't have let me go to London without a grant. Because how, how was I going to survive? Yeah. I had absolutely zip money. I had a pair of plimsolls, one pair of jeans, two T-shirts and a jumper. That's what I owned. And I went down to London with that to drama school. When it came to sort of winter season, because we started in September, one of the other students gave me a coat because I was cold. Oh, I, had, nice. um, I stayed with an uncle of mine who lived out in Gants Hill. And so, you know, but eventually some, what some students says, well, you've got, have we got a sofa? You know, we've got a spare room. Come stay with us. I was always a nice lad. And, um, and that's how things worked out for the whole of the drama school. You know, I got donations of clothing. I didn't have any money. Eventually I got a 50% grant, which meant that they, my fees were paid. Okay. That happened after about four or five weeks. My fees got paid. And they gave me £225 for the, t- the longest term, which is 20, 12 weeks. And that doesn't go very far in London, you know. But uh, it was enough to keep me alive and stay, sl- staying on people's floors and things like that. And um, Charlie Lawson was at drama school with us and Charlie had inherited some money from his grandfather or something. And uh, so it was like quite a lot of money, you know. I think he inherited about 12 or 15 grand or something, you know. So he'd buy us a bit of food and he'd buy us drink and things like that, you know. So your friends would keep you alive, as it were, you know. I must have been well skinny. Did you ever have a feeling before those four or five weeks before the money came through, what if the money doesn't come through? Did you ever have a feeling, well, what am I going to do? What am I actually going to do? I always, in the back of my mind, thought it's going to be fine. So you were always very positive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I just thought, well, I'm here now. I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. Let's see how it happens. And they, they also knew at the Guildhall that that wasn't enough money to sustain me. So in year two, second year, I got this award called the Ben Travis Award. Ben Travis apparently was a Guildhall, you know, he wrote Ghost Train and, um, um, no, he wrote, um, yeah, yeah, Ghost Train, I think and a couple of other plays in the 20s, and he'd left a bursary. So I got that bursary set in my second year, which was great. And um, so that helped to keep me alive. But they knew the Guildhall were doing what they could to keep me um, alive, you know. And was there ever any time during your three years where you thought, I don't know if this is for me, actually. I mean, I was so positive going to drama school, but, you know, sometimes they, t- they love to break you down and sort yeah. of build things back up. And, you know, that sort of separates people. You mm-hmm. know, people do drop out during those years. Did that ever happen to you, or were you still as positive as you were from day one? Massively positive as I was from day one and after I'd left. Because you could see that sometimes they wanted to psychologically have a go at you, you yeah. know, but they've got to be smart to pull one over me, you know, and I just thought, well, you know, I can see what you're doing, and I'm not upset, so cheerio. I mean, but, you know, if, if you worked, if you worked hard, you got your stuff done. Because I remember turning up with... Um, Ginny Snyder, who was one of our teachers there, and uh, you used to have to learn a speech. Um, and then she'd go in and break it apart, you see, and teach you whatever it was, a piece of Shakespeare normally. And I went in and said, I'm sorry, Ginny, I haven't learnt it this week. And she just said, long pause, tough, it's your life. And then didn't speak. And then I, I, so I took it as my cue that I wasn't 
meant to be in the room, you know. So, boy, did I go off and learn that speech, yeah. you know, for the next week. And so you couldn't get lazy on yourself, you know. You couldn't rely on it because, the, as you know, in this game, you, you stop turning up, you don't learn your words, so, you know, you're out of a job. You yeah. know? So, again, it was that a little shocked, uh, you know, shocked me into sort of doing something properly again. But such a small thing can make such a massive impact on you at such a young age. Absolutely right, you know, especially, like you say, when I was just hugely enthusiastic about everything. So to get a knockback like that um, was especially in my situation, because if I was asked to leave, you know, that would be it. I didn't know what I would be able to do, go and join the National Youth Theatre and beg, you know. That's kind of what I had in my mind. But uh, I'd never thought it would come to that. I always thought it'd be, I was going to be fine. And when you, your three years were up, were you one of those ones that went, right, OK, I've just got a job, you're walking straight out to a job? Or was there a long period of being out of work straight after? No, I didn't even complete my three years. Really? Yeah, I got a panto, Christmas 82. Uh, and uh, So it was Christmas between 81 and 82, you know, that year. And um, with Esther Charkin was directing it. So I must have been third year, so it was either 82 or 83. It might be 82, 83, actually. And um, I got a panto at Chipping Norton in Oxfordshire. Because in the meantime, to support my um, financials at drama school, I'd started to do street theatre with a guy at drama school with us. Is this it, something like in Covent Garden or around in Guildford? Co- in Covent Garden. I mean, ended up doing festivals and everything and getting contracts so that we were building up, because you needed um, to have t- uh, 40 weeks on your, of contracts in to order to qualify your, for an equity card. card. Yeah. So, um, so we were doing festivals and things like that and earning money. You know, all of a sudden, I can afford to buy people drinks, you know, I can, all this. But Covent Garden, you know, doing four hours of shows a day, you know, um, every day during the summer holiday break and then at the weekends during college, whenever we could, because we were rehearsing for other things at the same time, um, getting down to Covent Garden and earning a bit of money. But um, what was it? I've forgotten what I was talking about now. I'm not surprised. So I think it was, it was when, you, when you graduated about walking into a job That's straight right. away. So I got straight away um, an equity card and went straight into the panto and then um, had an agent as well, Louis Hammond, who's retired from being an agent now. I think he's a casting director. And he... Uh, and going in uh, and... Um, you know, him saying, I'd like to represent you, and saying, why don't you just leave drama school? So then having to go into the principal and say, I'm leaving. And the principal just said, OK, fine. Oh, really? Yeah. That simple? Yeah. I've got a job. I said, I've got a job. I've got an agent. I don't see why I should um, hang around. And he said, absolutely fine. Yeah, go out there in the world. The world's ready for you. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought that was really nice, because a lot of them say... A lot of them um, these days, I hear from the from the kids, you know, number one, it's a degree course these days, so they have to stick it out. Um, but they don't quite, they don't really like that if you're going out there. They, they seem to think you're unprepared. But well, that, it's, it's not, it didn't happen to me, so. It's funny because there's, there's certain contradicting points from, from many different people who run established businesses and companies well within the arts. Some are saying that they think it's essential that a three-year training is, is for the... For the young uns, mm. the young uns. That's yeah. the one that's Sam Patrick. <laughs> no, you know, but... we're, we're well over forty now. And then there's other people that are saying it doesn't matter. You don't really need that formal training nowadays. And with there's no grants around, with money being what it is, a lot of people can't afford yeah. ten, eleven thousand pound a year on yeah. this training. No, there are many really successful actors who didn't go anywhere near a drama school, who came through their local youth drama and then got in touch with agents, etc., or age smart agents and smart casting directors go down to these little youth programmes and pick people out from there. You know, rather than... Because there is this thing, isn't there, that now you've got to have a certain amount of uh, financial backing in order to be able to go to a drama school. Of course. Because it's a non so it's a vocational course in many ways. It's not really a proper degree. Uh, and, um, you know, so to force out those people who aren't capable of getting a, an academic, um, uh, aren't capable of having an academic background, uh, who did it vocationally, myself included, because I, I screwed my A-levels up, etc. and, you know... Uh, don't have the opportunity to go unless... I mean, some, so some of them, it's a second degree, you know. They come from Oxbridge and then do a second degree. Yeah. And so it's kind of, where are all the people of the great actors of the 60s that didn't have a degree, didn't want a degree, and weren't interested in academia? And now they've made it an academic course, and it's uh, that, I think, is it's creating a whole different type of actor as well, you know. So you're saying, you know, the people that are coming in and being churned out are of a, a certain 
class system, really, if you want. Yeah. I, mean, I don't want to blanket that. But. No, because there are, you know, obviously there are um, there are great people who manage to get through proper working class, etc. But you'll find that it is linked to a degree course and certain A levels. Now you have to have A levels to a certain standard in order to do this degree course, which is a drama school course. You know, because the because the drama schools themselves were forced into a situation where there aren't there is no money for vocational. Uh, 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 even if you're going to go and be an apprentice plumber, you know, there, there's someone's got to find the money. The local government will have to find the money from somewhere. You know, maybe we should be voting for Jeremy Corbyn this time <laughs> round because he is going to eradicate the fees. It's yeah. not a political podcast. <laughs> okay, um, I, I won't go there. <laughs> did you, throughout, I mean, you've had a, you have had a brilliant career, but when you graduate from drama school, you're straight into panto and you're being very successful quite young. Where was the dark times? Where was the times where... Did you ever have a plan B? Did you ever think, oh, this isn't happening? What, what am I going to do? No, I didn't really. I always thought, um, you know... When do I was... you think you should have a plan B? Someone once told me to be so positive, don't never have a plan B. Yeah, I, I kind of had that in my head. If you've got a plan B, you'll probably do it. Exactly. You know, and um, so I've never had a plan B. I've thought, you know... And I've never had another job either. I've 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 been constantly is that wood? I better touch something that's some wood. Some form of form form mic. Mic. Okay, yeah, exactly. I can't touch my head. Um, that you know, I've never needed to do another job, um, uh, which is great. You know, um, but I never thought that I would have to either. You know, in my mind, I've always thought I can always go back and do street theatre, which is where I made good money. So I learnt um, a lot of craft and. Um, grew big cojones because your audience can walk away and they do. Yeah. You know, so some days you can go out and, and get a fiver and some days you'll go out and get 90 quid a show, depending on um, what time of year it is and how, how good form you're in, you know. Did you find with the training, because you do get, you get so much thrown at you that mm. it is hard to process. You kind of stick it all in your backpack for mm. future reference. And then over the years you're pulling stuff out going... Oh, Actually, this is when I need this. I might not need this for another five years, but you might be on a film set, you might be on a stage, and then you can pull it out. Yeah. Do you think that's a, a great thing about drama school? Or do you think also that if you didn't go down the, say, traditional route of going to drama school, the more jobs you do, the more stuff you pick up? Because, I, you know, the great thing about what we do is that you're still learning, and you're still learning off brilliant people from yeah. job to job, yeah. whatever form of, if it's film, television, or theatre. Yeah. Well, there's certain, obviously, I'm, whenever I walk on a set or uh, onto a film or in a play and everything, I'm just thinking, who can I play to your eyes now? <laughs> <laughs> and, but there are certain things that you need to have under your belt, which is the craft, like, you know, like, like hitting the marks, like understanding what the lens size is, like, um, um, like being aware of people around you if you're in a stage show, you know what I mean? There's, you often walk even just walking down a normal street, Oxford Street or whatever, uh, people bumping into each, or, into each other all the time. Well, you know, there can be 50 people on a stage and no one bumps into each other because you've learnt that craft. Spatial to, awareness. The, spatial awareness, um, you know, um, vocal techniques, um, just stuff that when you get crammed in at drama school, and we had Patsy Rodenberg, brilliant voice teacher, so uh, the control of your voice, um, the agility of, uh, of having a, of a voice, being able to be heard, enunciation, all those things then hitting when you get into the TV world hitting marks and how important that is um, the craft of um, minimising a performance etc knowing when to maximise it all of that stuff is experience you know I was mentored very heavily in the first because I got boon when I was about 24 or something and um, my, the great Michael Elphick was the one who would say you don't need to turn around for that the camera will come around there and we'll get it out <laughs> really? Okay, really? yeah 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 don't worry about it you know <laughs> Um, just, just little tips and little things like that. Don't worry. If they want it, they'll come and get it. But that's the great thing. You never stop learning off people nope, like that. Even now, you, you just, it just happens all the time. But also, it's great to learn from the, the great talents of the young people that we work with as well. Yeah. I mean, I'm 55 now, and these kids coming in now who are absolutely brilliant, um, who seem to have, you know, no hang-ups like we used to have back in the day. It was a... It was a Obviously, it's progressive business, like it always is. Technologically, it's gone beyond anything I ever could conceive of when I left drama school, you know. 
um, in terms of, you know, even just microphones, cameras, the digital capabilities, you know, et cetera. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Um, but it's, so it's eradicated some of the old craft. But when you, when you work with some of the older people, you know, because you never have to check the gate anymore. I've, people who don't know what that is, you know, when a, re, when a film is spooling through a camera at 24 frames a second, small shavings um, come off the side as they pass through the aperture. And, if, and when you take the lens off and look in with a magnifying glass, you can see whether those, what they call it, a hair, like a small shaving, was wobbling in front of the lens. And if you, when you watch old movies, you can see that sometimes there were hair in the game yeah. that got missed, you know. So none of that exists anymore with digital. Plus, you only had... You couldn't do a shot that lasted more than 10 minutes because that's how long a reel lasted. Now, you, on one of these digital discs, you can shoot consistently for an hour, an hour and a half, you know, without um, calling a cut. It's just impossible to do. So it's much speedier these days. So we've had to get quicker at what we do. We were more relaxed having tea breaks, etc. back in the old days. I'm talking about the 80s, which doesn't seem that long ago. <laughs> the old days? Yeah, because you had to change um, cam- you had to change uh, mags, you know. You had to get things ready for the processing. Things had to go off to rushes. You never saw video playback. You know, you, you waited until the next day until you could see what you'd filmed that day, and then you might do a reshoot. So when we were doing Boom, for instance, it was a five-day week, and it was um, nine months to shoot 13 episodes. It felt very relaxed. These days, you know, whatever the, what thing they call it, the 11-day turnover, you know, you shoot six days, you shoot an hour in 11 days, yeah. you know. Which is madness. Well, it's not. It's brilliant, but it's just quicker. <laughs> isn't everything? Everything's speeding up now. Yeah. So, just to sort of round things off, if there's somebody out there now listening to this that maybe is in a similar position, whether maybe they're in care or they can't afford something, but they do have a burning ambition and they're bit, they're maybe not being as spurned on by a teacher like you have yeah. anything like that. Do you think there's any anything that you, you would say to them? <clears throat> at, the, at the earliest age possible, seek out the local youth drama. Seek out what's going on in your area. There's always going to be a club or, or something... Um, and most places, even if they're um, a fee-paying place, they'll, they'll take sympathy on you. If you've absolutely got nothing, if your circumstances, um, go and ask. Go and get involved. Get involved in getting on stage as well. Get, get over your fear of the stage, because these days a lot of people will go straight into television, youngsters, from, um, not from necessarily from drama school, who have a fear of, of going on stage in front yeah. of people. And at the very least, it's going to build your confidence in life, not just to be an actor. But if someone's got a burning ambition to be an actor, it doesn't matter what colour, creed, size, shape you are, there's, a, there's, there are, there's things for you in this business. There's a, there's a family for you out yeah, there. You know, and get well, there and start learning now. Start learning. And it doesn't matter, you know, if... Uh, don't, don't listen to what people say either because it's one of those games that you will get better at. you just got to keep practising. It's the same... It's a bit like snooker, you know. The first time you look at a 12-foot by 6-foot um, table with a, with a lump of wood and a load of balls on it, you're going to spread them all over the place and it's going to make no sense whatsoever. But as soon as you start learning a little bit of that craft and people start positioning you in the right place and everything, before you know it, you'll be making one four sevens. Neil, you're a gentleman. Thank you so much, man. Mon plaisir. Can I just say, how amazing is Neil Morrissey? Come on. He's so positive. Lovely, lovely guy. Neil, thanks so much for having a sit down there and thank you for listening. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Hit subscribe, okay? Join us on Twitter, at Two Shot Pod. Instagram, at Two Shot Pod. We're going to throw out some nice exclusive videos, exclusive photos just for you. Join us on Facebook, it's the Two Shot Podcast. Email if you want, I don't mind, twoshotpod at gmail.com. It'd be lovely to hear from you. Let me know what you think. If there's anything you think, any guests you want on, throw that around. We might even be able to get them in. I want to thank the Spike... I can't even say it. I have trouble every week. It's Splicing Block. www.splicingblock.com. Go on there. Have a look what they do. You can search for them on Twitter, Facebook, even Instagram. They're the ones who make it happen. Splicingblock.com. But thank you for joining us. I'll see you next week. Take care. Two Shot Pod. The Two Shot Podcast is presented by me, Craig Parkinson, recorded and produced by Thomas Griffin for Splicing Block. Our music, our brilliant music, is courtesy of Then Thickens. Cheers.